So what's exciting about this agent is that in a patient population that was heavily treated, five to six lines of therapy, we have a response rate of around 70% in patients who were not prior T-cell redirected exposed. And even in those who were had prior exposure to these drugs, which is the new unmet need, the response rate was 63%. The progression through survival uh, for the every two week dosing at 0.8 milligrams per kilogram is actually a very impressive 14 months, which is actually the best of any bispecific uh, that we have to date. Um, and I think these efficacy results for an off-the-shelf product are really important. And it also is the first uh, GPRC-targeted compound. Uh, we have two CAR-Ts and two bispecifics that target BCMA, but this is the first in class and only one uh, to target GPRC-5D. The safety of this drug um, has the typical bispecific characteristics of CRS, um, about 70 to 80%, but primarily low grade. Uh, ICANS is uh, noted, primarily, again, low-grade, 10%. Some of that is in the setting of CRS. Um, and un interestingly, unlike the BCMA compounds, we don't see a lot of deaths due to infection uh, or infection complications in general. Um, I, and I think that's important because in this population, you do see a lot of infections because these are heavily treated patients with, um, who are typically older and have had many prior therapies, and yet in that setting, even though talquetamab was also accruing patients during the COVID pandemic, we don't see COVID-related deaths. And I think that's a really important characteristic. However, there are some on-target, off-tumor side effects that come with this drug. GPRC5D is a transmembrane protein that's overexpressed on heavily keratinized tissues. That includes the skin, so we do see rashes primarily in the first cycle that are quite manageable with topical steroids. And for rare patients who has high-grade rash, we give a short course of oral steroids. The nails can be friable. Um, the, the palms of the uh, and soles can have desquamation, which are also typically manageable with steroids. Um, I think the more challenging AE that we've had to figure out how to manage is the oral toxicities, which typically can manifest with dry mouth, loss of taste, sometimes dryness leads to difficulty swallowing, dysphagia. For those, uh, we've tried uh, encouraging oral hydration, uh, sialagogues to keep the saliva going, uh, candies, um, protein shakes or uh, high calorie shakes to offset the weight loss. But I think the mainstay that I found to be helpful for this AE is really uh, reducing the dose intensity. And what I mean by that is the median time to response with this drug is rapid, which is great. It's about one month. So you know that a patient's responding and if they have an AE that's um, not manageable with supportive care, you can skip a dose and then come back with either a lower dosing uh, per dose or lower frequency. And that has led to a good success. And so in my experience at Mount Sinai, which was my former institution of treating about 100 patients with either monotherapy or combination, we only had one patient come off for non-progression. Um, so I think in general, these AEs are manageable with supportive care and or dose modulations. So GPRC5D is a transmembrane protein. The gene sits on chromosome 12P, um, and the, we don't know a lot about its signaling and function, uh, but we know it's overexpressed, particularly in malignant plasma cells, even more so than normal plasma cells. And I think that may feed into some of the reason why you don't see as much infection. For example, um, during the COVID pandemic, we found that patients who were getting talquetamab actually were able to mount an antibody response to COVID vaccines, which patients getting BCMA by specifics were not able to. Um, so that overexpression on myeloma lends its specificity, um, but then that overexpression on heavily keratinized tissue also lends to its um, side effect profile. The drug itself is a uh, bispecific, so one part binds CD3, the other part binds GPRC5D, um, and I call it kind of like the handcuffs or the um, uh, double-sided tape, if you will, so these molecules are basically trafficking the T-cells in the patient to the myeloma, and then when those T-cells recognize the myeloma, they release uh, things like perforin, granzymes to cause cell death of the target cell, which is the myeloma cell, and that's what we want. Well, the, currently the label is four or more lines of therapy and have had triple class exposure to PI, IMID, and CD38. Um, so when a patient meets that, uh, the question is, how would you use this agent, particularly considering now that we have two BCMA bispecifics and two CAR-Ts? Um, I think currently the best product we have in myeloma to date is probably the CAR-T Siltacel. 
because of the response rate of nearly 100% and the progression-free survival of three years. So if I can get a patient to silt to cell, which is pretty much a patient who has um, not too rapidly progressing disease, and I can get a silt to cell spot and um, can tolerate high-grade CRS should it occur, I'm going to try to get that patient to silt to cell, in which case, um, if I were to use telquetamab prior to silt to cell, I would probably try to get the T cells collected first um, before starting the telquetamab. And the reason I say that is uh, we don't have a lot of data yet on when to collect T cells for um, silt to cell patients relative to bispecific. So until we have that data, I would collect the T cells first. I, I would feel comfortable using telquetamab as a bridging therapy until silt to cell. Um, and then if a patient has already had silt to cell or for some reason is not a CAR-T candidate, then I think it's dealer's choice of whether to do tech or TAL or the other BCMA bispecific. Um, and I think part of that thought has to be, what was the patient's last therapy? Um, we now understand that both BCMA and GPRC could be lost after prior therapy. So if they had a prior BCMA, maybe I would want to switch to GPRC. Um, and then we also need to think about maybe sandwiching, because ideally, uh, if you can get a break between T-cell redirection to T-cell redirection, it might be beneficial to avoid exhaustion. So those are some strategies, but I think the fact that this is the only product targeting this antigen shows um, its unique place in the armamentarium, and it's, there's a dire need for all of these assets, because although our patients are living longer and longer, um, our patients still relapse. I think it's, uh, means that we can access the drug now. Um, and while we're going to need a confirmatory phase three study, as with all accelerated approvals, I'm encouraged that there's not a, a death signal, right? Because I think one of the things that's always difficult to interpret from a single arm study is what are the, uh, what are the side effects of this drug that are coming from the patient, the disease, or the treatment? And you can't isolate that. And when you have a randomized study, that's how you can determine it. Um, but here, I'm not concerned about any uh, overall survival harm from this product because there's really almost no deaths from AEs, which means that the response and PFS should also translate into overall survival. And so even though we don't have full approval yet, this accelerated approval is really exciting and it gives us options for our patients, whether it's before or after. And I should emphasize again that there was a uh, part of the approval included a cohort of patients who had prior T-cell redirection therapy. And those patients also had a very uh, good response of 63%. And um, so this uh, agent can also be used after prior T-cell redirection, which is a true unmet need. I think first is if, if you're a community doctor who's not given a bispecific, bispecifics are gonna be at your doorstep very soon, if not already today, right? It's because myeloma and lymphoma already have approved bispecifics now, but work is being done in solid tumors and other heme malignancies. So I think eventually these are going to be done, you know, globally. And in a way, it reminds me a little bit about where we were with monoclonal antibodies, such as rituximab or daratumumab, where initially we were, we had to learn about how to prevent infusion-related reactions. It was done at academic centers, and then everybody got familiar with it. We're in this learning curve now. We're trying to figure out how to do these uh, therapies safely. And so I think first thing is to do the REMS program, not only the physicians, but also the pharmacists and anyone who's touching the drug. Um, second is to educate the whole hospital system on CRS. Uh, that includes, because currently the label has a 48 hour hospitalization after each step up. So when the patients are hospitalized, the nurses need to be trained. The person who, uh, and then when the patient may have a fever, the person who's on call needs to be trained, and then pharmacists need to mix the drugs like tocilizumab quickly, and the nurse needs to hang the drug. So there's the whole hemonc team that needs to be educated, but also training neurologists, um, ICU staff, ER staff about this whole new exciting class of drugs called bispecifics is, uh, I think, going to be very important to get these drugs delivered safely because there are patients, um, there are so many patients that need this drug, and they're not going to all be able to come to academic centers. And the sooner we can make this safe for everybody to give uh, at a center near you, uh, the better it is for patients.